everyone, so welcome again to our Bhakti Vaibhav. Uh, let's share the screen. Recording in progress. Is everyone able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. So, remember, we're on, we're studying the second canto, the Pada, which is still the Pada Padma, the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And the first chapter begins with Sukadeva Goswami replying to the question of Maharaj Parikshit. Right? Before I begin, let me first of all offer prayers. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chatsurun Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita nam pavanebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadigor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're studying the second canto, first chapter, entitled First Steps in God Realization. And the chapter begins with Sukadeva Goswami appreciating the question put by Maharaj Parikshit. Of course, and that question came in the previous canto. Uh, I just wanted to give you this quote here from Prabhupada's lecture because somehow this slide didn't come up yesterday when I was going through the slides. All right. Would someone like to read this for me, please? Hare Krishna. Go ahead, Prabhuji. question was about Krishna and the reply is Srimad Bhagavatam, 18,000 verses. And each and every verse is so important that if a serious student studies each and every verse, each verse will take at least one month to understand. And there are 18,000 verses. So for serious study of Srimad Bhagavatam, it will take 18,000 months. So 18,000 months meaning how many years? 1,500 years. Okay, wait. And can you read this one? Because this Bhagavata is so nice, transcendental subject matter discussed about Krishna. It is Loka Hitam. It should be spread all over the world. Loka does not mean your country or your society, Brahmana society or Goswami society. No. Loka Hitam for the benefit of the whole world. That is Loka Hitam. Not only of this world, but other worlds also. Of the whole universe, Loka Hitam, uh, Rupa, my dear king, your Prashna, your Prashna. So this message of Srimad Bhagavatam should be spread all over the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, so very important point here. This message of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is for the whole world. It is not meant for just a few people. It is 
the real education. Uh, there's one family. Uh, the mother did homeschooling and she educated, she had two sons and she educated them herself at home. And they both went, you know, one of them is a professor and they both did PhDs and very, the, the education came out so well. Why? The mother simply used Srimad Bhagavatam in teaching her children. She educated them on using the Srimad Bhagavatam. Everything is there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So you, you can learn. I know many people, they just simply read the Srimad Bhagavatam and they learned the, the language. They learned perfect English just by reading Srimad Bhagavatam. Some Russian devotees like that, they didn't know English, they just read Srimad Bhagavatam and they became very fluent in English. So everything is there in Srimad Bhagavatam, all kinds of knowledge. Right? So, yesterday we were talking, let's see, where are we? I think from here. Okay. So yesterday we, we explained the connection between the first and second cantos. One, do you remember how we explained the connection between the first and second canto? Someone can answer? What was the connection? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, the first canto ends where Parishit Maharaj asked the two, uh, three questions that uh, what everyone should do generally at all time and second specifically what one can do at the time of death. And what is good for hearing, what is what is good for worship, and what is not good. So, to the answers to this question, Shukdev Goswami begins the second. Very good. Thank you so much. And then we give a, a brief overview of the second canto. As, you, as we go through the second canto, you'll see more of that. A more detailed overview. Chapters 1 to 5, which I'm presenting in these uh, next couple of weeks. And then summarize the essence of Sukadeva Goswami's answer to Parikshit Maharaj's question. Right? We summarize the essence of Sukadeva Goswami's answer that we should always hear, chant, and remember about Krishna and what we should not do. We should never forget Krishna. That's what we shouldn't do, right? We should always remember Krishna. So that's. That was an understanding. Then Prabhupada's mood and mission, the following phrases reflect Srila Prabhupada's mission. Lokahitam, we read just now about this Srimad Bhagavatam, how it's beneficial for everyone. People of Sukadeva Goswami said people have waste so much time hearing and chanting the Gramyakta, the village talk. They read mundane newspapers and they listen to mundane radio sound waves. But if they will hear the spiritual vibration, the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is literary incarnation of Krishna, and specifically for people in the Kali Yuga, then it will give the greatest benefit for people. And then a Pashyatam Atmatadvam. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is essential at the present moment. Because people are so blind, they're so absorbed in their material life, they're so blinded by the glitter of the bright lights of the cities and so on, that they forget the goal of life, they forget that it's all temporary, and they forget that we're going to have to give up this material body one day. And they never inquire about the nature of the soul. So apashyatamatmatatvam, they never make any inquiries. They don't try to understand what is the real goal of life. 
So we, this is Prabhupada's mode of mission, to bring people out of that ignorance, to bring them to higher consciousness. We spoke a bit about the Srimad Bhagavatam's description of materialistic life. We described the Grihamedis, right, how they're very strongly attached to sleeping and sex and they're, they will eat everything without any discrimination and they never have any time to, they never make any time for spiritual inquiry. They just waste the whole life in sense gratification. And then we spoke about how to defend ourselves against nama parad, how we can take care to avoid nama parad, doing things like loud chanting, keeping away from gossiping while we're chanting, and also staying away from gadgets, putting our hand, switching our handphone off, doing things like that will help us to guard against Nama Parad. Chanting in front of the deities, go to the temple room, or so, chanting early in the morning, these kind of things all help us to avoid Nama Parad. Plan how to create a favorable lifestyle for chanting. Favorable lifestyle for chanting, being with the devotees. That's good lifestyle. Get good association. Try to get good association and try to chant in the association of serious devotees. Attending Japa workshops is also very helpful. Planning your day so that you have time to chant. Don't leave chanting until the last thing at night. Some people do it, they have to do it, but it's not the best thing. But we, at least we have to plan to get our rounds done every day. And then the qualities of an ideal hearer of Bhagavatam. Does someone like to bring up to tell us what were some good qualities for a hearer of Bhagavatam? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Uh, a hearer should be attentive and submissive to the person who is speaking and also should ask appropriate questions which is good for the welfare of others and himself. Okay, yes, very good. Very nice. Anyone else like to add anything? Enthusiastic. Enthusiasm, yes, good. Eagerness to hear. Eagerness to hear, yes, that's enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, to not have a challenging uh, um, yes. mind. Yes, that question shouldn't be challenging. Yes. Faith in the spiritual master and... Uh, What's that? Faith in the uh, reciter and supreme lord. I'm not getting fully what you say, sorry, it's not so clear. Should you hear and try to remember? Try to remember. Yes, hear carefully, try to remember. Yes. Good hearer, they will remember what they hear, right? It should go into the heart. Shouldn't go is in one ear and out the other. It should should go to the heart that we remember. You should take something. Actually, what we should have done when we began the class today, we should I should have asked you what you remember from yesterday's class. <laughs> That's what uh, His Grace Barijan Prabhu does when he begins the class. He will say, "What do you remember from yesterday's class?" <laughs> 
He wants to know that something was remembered. Hmm? So, of course, we did this yesterday, so that I'm, this is good, you're remembering good quality, the qualities of the hearer of the Bhagavatam. All right, and then preaching application. Presented the example of Sukadeva Goswami as an impersonalist who, being attracted by the transcendental pastimes of the Lord, became a devotee. So Sukadeva Goswami, actually I don't, we didn't speak about that, it came up in text number 9, that Sukadeva Goswami was an impersonalist, but he heard the topics of the Lord and he became attracted. And we did speak about people who, they became devotees, right? That they, they just heard and they, their minds changed. And we had many examples yesterday, different devotees, how they, they simply heard about Krishna and they took up devotional service, right? What were some of the examples? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj. Yes. Who else? Four Kumaras also. Four Kumaras, yes. Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada also. Third Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Jharkhand uh, forest, he was telling everybody to all the animals, they were all chanting Hare Krishna. Okay, yes. Like that, many people, by hearing the pastimes of the Lord or hearing the glories of the Lord, became attracted. And then evaluation. We examined the application of the guidelines for dealing with blasphemy in a contemporary context. And what should we do in the contemporary context? When someone is blasphemous, what are we going to do? First of all, we should the holy name of the Lord, the uh, Supreme Lord. If it is not possible, you should leave the place. Again, if it is not possible, then you have to commit suicide. <laughs> no, no, no. We said you cannot commit suicide. Under no circumstances can you commit suicide. We're not going, we're not going to let you commit suicide, Prabhu. Sorry. You have to stay with us. All right, but yeah, you do have to leave the place. And you, if you can't leave the place, then well, of Prabhupada was in Japan at one time and somebody was speaking impersonal philosophy and Prabhupada said, begin the kirtan. He had the devotees stand up and chant. So you could also, you know, just block your ears, you know. Someone is talking very offensively, just block your ears. And you can't go away. If you can't go away, then do, do that. You just block your ears. You don't want to hear. Okay. So, connection with the previous lesson. Someone read? <coughs> Hare Krishna. Connection with previous lesson. After reassuring Parikshut Maharaj by mentioning King Katwanga's example, Sukadev Goswami begins to explain the process of mystic yoga by which one may achieve the supreme destination. The preliminary stage of this process involves Meditation on the universal form, as described in the second half of this chapter. Hare Krishna. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a cold this morning. Uh, Alright, so Sukadev. Okay, we got disconnected. We're in India. Mayapur, it's a cloudy day. It's not very convenient. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, someone please read. Uh, verse 14 to 21, Shukadev Goswami recommends detachment from material life. One should leave home and practice self-control in a sacred place. One should chant the Pranava Mantra Omkara and the mind will become progressively spiritualized. 
thereafter by meditation on the form of vishnu come to the level of devotional service verse 22 to 39 shukadev goswami describes meditation on the gross universal form of the lord because there is nothing more than this in the material world one who does not concentrate his mind upon the supreme personality of godhead will be misled and will cause his own degradation hari krishna pranam sri okay very good so this is the overview of what we're going to cover today in the rest of this chapter here we see sukadeva goswami continuing so he will describe first renunciation and then the mechanical process for meditation and then he will describe meditation on the universal form and we will talk about the concept of that virata roop okay so this is actually pantheism pantheism mentioned here in text number 20 the neophyte impersonalist is given a chance to realize the relation of the lord in everything by the philosophy of pantheism right so, so pantheism to see the world as god this is, this is the idea of the pantheist philosophy you see the world as god and see everything in the world as in relation to god so this is for mentioned here ne a neophyte impersonalist and we're going to hear about how to do this So, he's going to do this, uh, he wants to make advancement in the spiritual process. It's a yoga process. It's all yoga. We also, we're also yogis. We're bhakti yogis. They're, these people are maybe more, they're karma misra yogis. They're some yoga with some fruit of activity or maybe jnana mishra yoga. Anyway, we're going to hear how they do this yoga, which is actually astanga yoga, right? And so astanga yoga, yoga process. The first thing in the astanga process, eight stages, first thing is yama. So yama, dira, dira meaning sober-minded. He has to be very sober, uh, controlled in the mind. So this is the first stage and it's recommended should practice brahmacharya. In other words, it should be celibate, completely celibate. Uh, to practice the Astanga Yoga process, one would not be married, it would be a brahmachari or brahmacharini as the case may be. We don't associate because you come together with the opposite sex, the mind will be d disturbed. So this is the first stage of the yoga process. Practice brahmacharya. Brahmacharis don't stay at home. They don't stay with the mother and father. They go out and go and stay with, they must go and stay in the spiritual ashram, go and stay with the guru. The brahmachari is not just a, a, an unmarried man. That's a bachelor. Somebody's not married doesn't mean they're brahmachari, they're a bachelor. But a brahmachari is one who's on the path of Brahman. He's a, trying to endeavor for the spiritual path. And he should associate with the spiritual teacher, live in the ashram and progress in that way. Sometimes people think they're brahmacharis but just because they're not married. They work in a job and like that, they have a job and they're not married, they say I'm brahmachari. That's not brahmachari. Brahmachari means spiritual life. In spiritual life you live in the ashram in the association of the guru. Now, this is the first step, dira. So, then second step, the yam and niyam. 
the, the, first thing, the things you don't do, yama is what you don't do, you don't do association with the opposite sex, you don't get involved with the opposite sex. And the second thing, the niyama, the things you do, what you have to do, you have to go to the holy places and you have to bathe in the holy rivers there. So bathing in the holy rivers, that's the second stage. And you can see, if you read through that first chapter, you can read how these different points are all presented in the verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then the third step, asana. So it's yam, niyam, asana. Asana is the sitting postures. So starting on the asana made according to the rules, sitting on the asana made according to the rules of kusha, deer skin and cloth is the third stage of asana. Right? You get a proper seat. You're going to sit there because you're going to do astanga yoga, you're going to do meditation. You're going to have to sit. You have to have a good seat. So you want a comfortable seat and you shouldn't have to be worried about other things, other creatures coming and crawling on you. So you put a deer skin out and you cover it with cloth and then you sit on it. Then you're peaceful. And then the fourth thing, pranayama. Pranayama, Prabhupada called that the nose pressing yoga. The nose pressing yoga. Anybody do pranayama here? Do you have any yogis in our class today? No? Anyway, pranayama. Some yogis, they do pranayama, they can live, it, it, you can prolong your life. Some yogis, they do pranayama in the Himalayas and they will come for Kumbha Mela every, once every 12 years, they'll come to Kumbha Mela. And they can be hundreds of years old, but you don't know it, you don't recognize it. They live in, they live in a cave and they, they live alone, they just do pranayama, they live a long time. But that's not the goal of life. As we heard, better a moment of full consciousness than a whole lifetime like a tree. So pranayama, it says chanting the three syllables combined as om. Three syllables, A-U-M, Aum. <laughs> I thought it was a one-syllable mantra, you said three syllables. Aum is really a one-syllable mantra, but they put three, I don't know. I'll have to find out about that. So chanting Aum repeatedly is the fourth stage, pranayama. That gets mechanical control of the mind. And then fifth one, Pratyahara. All, all of these different stages are described here within the verses of the Srimad, in this first chapter. Sukadeva Goswami is describing how to practice the yoga process, verses 15 to 21. So by the controlled mind, one should withdraw the senses such as eye and ear from the sense objects such as sound and sight, the other things, whatever you see. So we have to keep the, the senses away from the sense objects. This is pratyahara and that is the fifth stage of the yoga process, withdrawing the senses, internalizing them, looking within, hearing within, not being concerned with what's going on around you. That's the fifth step and here's the sixth step. The mind whose assistant is the intelligence which discriminates should then concentrate with intelligence on the form of the Lord. Subharti, the form of the Lord, Shubharti. This is the sixth stage of dharana, right? So, yam, niyam, asan, pratyahara, yam, niyam, asan, pranayama, 
then pratyahara, then dharana. So this dharana is actually beginning to concentrate on the form of the Lord. Again, you're internalizing. You're not concerned with anything around you. You're simply sitting and absorbed, concentrating on the form of the Lord within. Then the seventh stage, dhyana. One should meditate on the individual limbs of the Lord. Now sometimes Prabhupada would compare the Astanga Yoga process with the Bhakti Yoga process. And Prabhupada would say, the third step of Bhakti Yoga is the seventh step of the Astanga Yoga. The third step of Bhakti Yoga is Smarana, right? Shravanam, Kirtan, Smarana. So Smarana, remembering, Prabhupada compares that stage to the seventh stage, Dhyana, meditation on the limbs of the Lord. You can read this also when you study, well later on when you go to study third canto, Lord Kapila, I think it's chapter 29 in the third canto, and it's described in detail also, this meditation process. Because the Kapila, Sankhya Yoga taught by Lord Kapila is a mixture of uh, meditation along with devotion. Okay. And then finally, after dhyana comes samadhi, engaging the mind which is without contact with sense objects. One should not think of anything else. This is the brahman, the form, padam, of the Lord, in which the mind is pacified. This is the eighth stage. Samadhi. So, you can understand this is a very lengthy process. In the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes about Kardama Muni. Kardama Muni was a yogi. Kardama Muni did Astanga Yoga. <laughs> Excuse me. So Kadama Muni did Astanga Yoga in the Satya Yuga for 10,000 years. And then after he did the yoga, then the Lord came and told him that a nice girl was coming and she will make a good wife for you. And then Kardama Muni accepted Devahuti as his wife. Devahuti was brought there by her father, Swam Bhuvamanu. And in this way, Kardama Muni began his householder life after 10,000 years of practice of Astanga Yoga. So in the Kali Yuga, very difficult for people to go through these different stages of yoga. We do see commercially people offering courses in Astanga Yoga and they get about as far as the fourth step. They get to the Pranayama. Asana and Pranayama are popular, but they practically the Yama and the Niyama are forgotten. Yama and Niyama are forgotten. Pratyahara, impossible. So Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi also, no chance. Right? Any questions on this? This is the process of purifying the mind and senses. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Now it's one uh, clarification I want. In the Dharana stage, it is mentioned as the concentrate and concentrate with the intelligence of the form of the Lord. Again in Samadhi, it is talking the almost the same thing. The mind, uh, the, um, uh, like one should meditate on the, uh, sorry, uh, the same thing it says that engaging the mind without contact with sense one should not think of anything else other than the form of the Lord. Yes. Both are like concentrating on the form of the Lord. Is there, what are the, uh, like, what is the main difference? Well, it's just that the intensity of the meditation and concentration is increasing through these different stages. 
but practically there's not a great difference between dharana, dhyana and samadhi. They're all different stages of meditation. After the pratyahara, after you've cut off the senses, internalized everything, so the concentration is within, right? You're concentrating within. So the mind is assist whose assistant is the intelligence and then concentrate on the form of the Lord. So they're beginning the concentration on the form of the Lord. And then the meditation, you actually absorb, this is mentioning the individual limbs. So the form of the Lord, just like you'll see in Kapila Shiksha in the third canto, they begin by describing the overall form of the Lord, and then they talk about the individual limbs. So you begin with meditation on the overall form of the Lord. Then number seven, you're thinking more about the individual limbs of the Lord. And then finally you come to the samadhi, where you fix yourself on that, that particular, on the form of the Lord. It's the super soul, of course. Hmm. So engaging the mind which is without contact, so you completely cut off the contact with the sense objects. So there's no possibility of being distracted. Just like when Maharaj Parikshit came to the ashram of, was it uh, Samika Rishi, he was in meditation. So he, he was in meditation, he was doing his meditation. He didn't notice anybody come into the ashram, so he didn't receive Maharaj Parikshit. And even Maharaj Parikshit put the dead snake around his neck, he didn't even notice, because he was in samadhi. And so previously people, people it was quite common, it was common for people to know how to do this, to go to, into samadhi. And they don't, you don't get distracted, don't notice anything. So that is actually Brahman. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj, uh, Hare Krishna. In the Samadhi, is it like, uh, what you said is now, Prabhuji, it was very clear. Uh, in uh, Dharana, it is the overall form of the Lord. Uh, and in Samadhi, is it, uh, do they concentrate on the personal form of the Lord? Oh, yes. Thanks. Thanks. Samadhi, fixed mind, fixed on the form of the Lord. Okay, we'll go ahead. So, contemplating the universal form. After purifying oneself in that way, by doing things like going out from the home, you know, detaching yourself from the material world and coming into the spiritual ashram, then purifying yourself by practicing the different activities like bathing in the holy rivers and so on. And this will all help to purify the mind. And then chanting mantras, just like pranayama, you know, we don't do pranayama, but we do japa. And that's our breath control by chanting Hare Krishna mantra. So we get the same benefit as people doing pranayama. In fact, we get greater benefit because we're associating with the holy name of Lord Krishna. And we don't need to do asanas, but what we do do, we engage in the temple program and we do kirtan and chanting and dancing and offering obeisances all of these things, so we get the benefit of the asanas. You do all these activities and you'll be as healthy as any yogi. Understand? All right, discussion. If Sukadeva Goswami is a devotee, why is he presenting the process of mystic yoga, beginning with meditation on the virat? Anybody like to respond to this? What's the reasoning behind that? Sukadeva Goswami is a devotee. Why isn't he just preaching devotional service? 
Why is he talking about meditation on the Virat? Yes. Um, uh, because for, this is basically for the new effects. So you want to gradually get them from the impersonal, first from the impersonal. And then this is, that's why Prabhupada called this uh, chapter as the first stage of uh, um, God realization. Here, we, uh, you know, from the Nirava, Nirakaravadi, here at least they are coming to the, uh, you know, to concentrate on the, uh, the, the material form of the Lord. So then from material form, slowly he is taking to the um, Purusha avataras, then again to the Leela avataras and uh, the, how the, uh, the Lord performs his uh, Leela in his uh, own abode and then how he interacts with the devotees. Okay, yeah, that's uh, reasonable. Anybody else like to add anything to this? Okay, yes, Prabhu. One reason is that uh, Srimad Bhagavatam is for everyone. So everyone should be given a chance to gradually uh, come to the highest goal. Uh, because in the assembly also there were many people present, those who were yogi, uh, meditators and impersonalists, demigod worshippers. So, and uh, Shukdev Goswami wanted to present that he knows all the process and the best is the devotional service, not directly telling about devotional service. Oh, yes, very nice. Yes, very good. Yes, there were many people present and not everyone is ready to, not everyone is going to accept bhakti yoga. We have to understand the, the mood of the audience. That's important in, in giving presentations and so on, you know, when you have to come and give a class, you want to know who, who are the audience, you know, what are they like, what is their interest. And, how much devotee are they? Are they all initiated devotees? Are they new devotees? We, we need to know these things. Then you can properly present the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. So Sukadeva Goswami was also aware that when he's speaking to Maharaj Parikshit, he's also speaking to other people present there, not, who are not all devotees. And as you say, as Prabhu also pointed out, Srimad Bhagavatam is for everyone, and we think, just like in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna presents also different processes. So similarly here, also Sukadeva Goswami is presenting, and as other Prabhu said, the first step in self-realization, the first step, in contemplating, coming up from the coming out from gross materialism. Coming out from gross materialism is a big change, you know, getting people to give up the path of sense gratification and bringing them into the transcendental platform. It's a big jump up and sometimes it's easier for people to take it a bit more gradual and begin with meditation on the virata or as we called it, pantheism, the pantheistic philosophy. All right, any other point on this? Okay, you, yes? Uh, Shri Goswami himself uh, released the personal form of the Lord, so he won't give the same relishment to the others also. There is a reason, first you told him what you, uh, first you took their confidence, take it to confidence, then told him Rashtam Yoga, then he come to the final uh, personal, personal form of the Lord's meditation. So first, first of all, what, what do you have to do? Firstly, if he has taken and confident everybody, uh -huh. then explain about all the different yoga system. Then he wanted to give the, what enrichment he got it by looking the personal form of the Lord. He wanted to give to the same to the everybody. Oh, okay. Bring everyone up to that same platform. So those who are not so much familiar with the personal form of the Lord, they can come to that, they can be introduced to that by meditation on the Virat. Yes. All right. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Yes. It's also, it, is also that, it is also that, you know, uh, giving the knowledge of Brahman, Paramatma, then Bhagavan. The step by step, going gradually. Yes. Bhagavan. Well, yes, we're ah. seeing that in this, this first chapter, this is more the Brahman, then, then chapter 2 will be Paramatma, and third chapter will be Bhagavan. Yes, so the Absolute Truth is understood like that. 
so one phase is to go first of all to Brahman and then to Par and then to Bhagavan. But of course we don't usually do that. We go directly to Bhagavan. But as we said, it's a, sometimes too much for people. They're not ready for that. And so gradual process is there. And Sukadeva Goswami is giving everyone a chance to come up to that bhakti. Okay, let's go ahead. Since Maharaj Parikshit was already directly connected with the personal feature of the Lord, why did he inquire about that indirect process? Maharaj Parikshit was already connected, right? What do, you, what do you know about the history of Maharaj Parikshit? Someone can tell us. One of the ladies like to speak. Maharaj, he saw the Lord in the womb itself. So right from the beginning, even when he was in, this, in the womb of his mother, he had the darshan of the Lord and he was, as soon as he came out also, he was searching for that Supreme Lord. So he he was very much in that uh, level of Bhagavan or the Bhakti Marga. He was already in that level. Yes. Yes. Anything about his childhood? That's why he's also called Vishnu Radha. The Supreme Lord himself had uh, protected him in the womb of his mother. Yes, right. Vishnu Radha. And parikshit means what? Parikshit, because he was examining. Yes. He, was, he was examining, he was searching for that Supreme Lord, who, uh, whose darshan he had uh, of the, in the womb of his mother. Mm. And, and what about his family? They were all great devotees. In fact, he also says when he goes around uh, during the um, you know, subduing of uh, Kali, he comes to know how fortunate, he also feels fortunate in fact, we also saw in the beginning that he is feeling that he says he's proud, not because of ego, but he was proud that uh, the Supreme Lord uh, was a cousin and he was always protecting his uh, grandparents and he was very closely, he had that uh, family connection. So uh, he had the natural affection for the Supreme Lord Krishna. Yes, right. Okay. Thank you very much. So... Why did he inquire about this indirect process? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh -huh. uh, the Lord Actually, the same mood and mission as Srila Prabhupada identifies Loka Hitam. So, Shukadev Goswami also wanted to ask the question on behalf of all the people of the world so that. Uh, this gradually is described for everybody's well-being. Yes, yes, I think so. I think that's the correct answer. Out of compassion is concern for the well-being of the world and the audience there and everything. Yes. Anybody else want to add anything? Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj. So it is easy for common people to first understand or relate themselves to noble before going to the unknowable. So they can relate very easily. They can perceive the greatness of the Lord. Uh, like it is said first, you, uh, you need to understand the Aishwarya of the Lord and then slowly go on to his uh, intimate or the mellows, transcendental mellows. So without at least coming to that platform, we cannot un understand the personal feature of the Lord. Mm, very but the good. personal aspects or the Deep mellows of the Lord. Yes, very good. Very nice. Thank you very much. Okay, here's one more. How does this process of meditation constitute the first step in God-realization? How can it bring one closer to Krishna? So, how does this process meditation constitute the first step in God-realization? I think in some ways you really covered that already. Anyway, we could no harm to repeat. Someone else like to respond to that? The first why is it the first step in God realization?
Ladies, let's hear a lady answer. Yes. I have the, as it is said that uh, gradually going from Brahman, Paramatma to Bhagavan. So the first uh, process of God realization begins with the Brahman aspect where we learn to see the Lord's energy in everything and that he is present everywhere. Right. So meditation on the Virata. Right. Yes. First step yeah. with God realization. Yeah, very good. Yes, very good. Thank you very much. Right. Seeing the Lord in everything, seeing the world in relation to God, this is the impersonal aspect. But this is the first step, seeing the Brahman, understanding the Brahman feature. It's easier than to understand the Bhagavan feature. And how can I bring one closer to Krishna? Is it going to bring, we hope it will bring us closer to Krishna, <laughs> right? Maharaj, it's a gradual process, also an authentic yoga process, so gradually they go closer to Krishna. The mm, gradual process, yeah. Yes, it's a gradual process. So, are we sure that we're going to go to Krishna? Maybe we'll go to the Brahman. They, they can go to Hare Krishna Maharaj, they can go to Krishna only uh, by the mercy of a devotee. Yes. They become only a stage of Brahman, but until a uh, devotee's hand or mercy is there, right. they will not yes. realize Krishna. Yeah. Comes so how does that relate to the first step in God-realization? First and foremost thing, they uh, a living entity understands the uh, supremacy that God is a controller, proprietor, enjoyer. He comes to that platform. And then when he starts to um, understand more about his features, and then there is a mercy of a devotee. Uh, and if the costless mercy of the Supreme Lord himself is there, then he can go to that platform of Bhagavan. Yes. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, as uh, Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita that he is the pranava omkar in the Vedas. And once one starts meditating on the om, then gradually he gets elevated to the next level. And by the association of the devotee, that is what Shri Goswami is trying to do here, by his association, later uh, concentrating on the personal form of the Lord, then one will gradually come closer to Krishna. Mm, yes. Yes, just by doing spiritual practice somehow, you know, we t if you take up the yoga practice, then you'll attract the mercy of a devotee. Or if maybe you're, you yourself will be inclined to seek out the association of devotees by chanting and doing meditation and so on, we'll think, oh, I want to have more association. We'll look for somewhere where we can get association. And if we're very fortunate, we can get the association of devotees. And that can bring us to Krishna. So somehow we have to get that mercy of the devotees. And uh, we hope that we begin the first step. And then we'll want to go further. How to go further? I need to get find somebody and we'll look out, find out the devotees and they will guide us and bring us to Krishna. Hmm. So, next thing. What is the benefit of being aware of the universal form? Can someone read this for me, please? Hey, Krishna Maharaj. These dirty things of fruity work and empiric philosophy can be removed only by association with the Supreme Lord. The Lord, being omnipotent, can offer his association by his inconceivable potencies. Thus, persons who are unable to pin their faith on the personal feature of the Absolute are given a chance to associate with his Virata Rupa or the cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord. The cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord 
is a feature of his unlimited potencies. Since the potent and the potencies are identical, even the conception of his impersonal cosmic feature helps the conditioned souls to associate with the Lord indirectly and thus gradually rise to the stage of personal contact. Right. Yes, from Srimad Bhagavatam, first chapter, verse number 22 per port. So, Prabhupada explains here very clearly the, the benefits of being aware of the universal form. Right? This is a feature. It shows the, the, the inconceivable potency of the Lord. It helps us to understand that there's some personality behind the, the universe. That's it. The idea is we want to understand there's a person behind this world, not just simply energy, but a personality. So the whole idea is that we'll be inclined to take up service to that person. Okay, so a favour to the neophyte. Please read, someone. Maharaj, you can read. Virata Rupa. Okay. Maharaj, Virata Rupa. Maharaj, Maharaj, you going to read. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Maharaj, a favor to the neophyte. The Virata Rupa manifestation of the Lord is simultaneously a challenge to the atheist and a favor for the asuras. Who can think of the Lord as Virat and thus gradually cleanse the dirty things from their heart in order to become qualified to actually see the transcendental form of the Lord in the near future. This is a favor of the all-merciful Lord to the atheist and the gross materialist. Srimas Bhagavatam 2.1.24. All right. So we, we have to understand, we have to clean the heart, the dirty things. And then we become qualified to see the transcendental form of the Lord. Because our hearts are so dirty, we cannot actually see the Lord. So we have to purify ourselves. So this is this, how to purify ourselves, how to clean the heart. This meditation on the Virata Rup is one process in which we can, at least for the atheists and those people, it's an opportunity for them to think of God and gradually get rid of the dirty things. And here's some quotes, first of all, from Bhagavad Gita and then from Srimad Bhagavatam. The common man who has no love for Krishna cannot always think of Krishna. Therefore, he has to think materially. Because materialists cannot understand Krishna spiritually, they are advised to concentrate the mind on physical things and try to see how Krishna is manifested by physical representations. All right? Those of you who are fami familiar with this. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have one question Maharaj. In the previous slide, uh, there is mentioned it is a challenge to uh, atheist and uh, favor to asuras. So, is there any difference? Atheist is against the Lord, right? And asuras also against the Lord. So, is there any difference? You know, it's atheist and asuras, favors to asuras and challenge. A atheist to doesn't believe in the Lord. He doesn't believe there's a Lord. He just doesn't accept the Lord exists. The asuras, they're enemies of the Lord. They will fight him and they will oppose him. But the atheist just doesn't believe there is a Lord. All right. Now, Prabhupada talks about try to see Krishna manifest by physical representations. So, what are some of these representations? Anybody could give any example? Like for instance, he says, I am the taste in water, I am the mountain, uh, 
I'm the banyan tree, uh, I'm the Ujjayi, uh, he says, I am the strength in the strong people. Okay. Like he gives various examples uh, okay. in the verse number, in chapter 10. Yes, yes, these are the vibhutis, the different vibhutis of Lord Krishna, yes, understanding Krishna's opulences. Of course, uh, of course uh, someone's a common man, when he drinks water, it's unlikely that he would think, oh, this is Krishna, <laughs> right? The materialists cannot understand Krishna spiritually. They are advised to concentrate the mind on physical things and try to see Krishna. So if somebody, they have to be trying to see Krishna, then they can think like that, right? So this is the idea, that they're, they're, they're actually trying to see Krishna. Because they always think materially, so they, they don't, they, they're not able to see Krishna in, in the deity, and they don't have love for Krishna. But if they're trying to see Krishna, they want to see Krishna, and so we can guide them to think of Krishna in these ways, as Maharaji just said, taste in water, and so on. Okay, very good, thank you. And then the other one. Actually, all such descriptions are for the neophytes. The neophytes cannot conceive of anything beyond matter. The material conception of the Lord is not counted in the list of his factual forms. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.3.30 purport. So all such descriptions are for neophytes. <laughs> neophytes cannot conceive of anything beyond matter. We see materialistic people, material sciences, of course, they only think of matter. They don't think, they don't accept spirit. They don't accept that there is such a thing as spiritual energy. So the material conception of the Lord is not counted in the list of his factual forms. In other words, the form of the Lord is not material. So this, what we're hearing about the Virata Rup, this is actually a material form. It's a material conception. It's not actually the factual form of the Lord. Okay? All right, someone please read, Developing Service Attitude. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. The conception of the universal form of the Lord gives a chance to the materialistics to think of the Supreme Lord, but the materialistics must know for certain that his visualization of the world in a spirit of lording over it is not God-realization. The materialistic view of exploiting exploitation of the material resources is accustomed by the illusion of the external energy of the Lord. And as such, if anyone wants to realize the Supreme Truth by conceiving of the universal form of the Lord, he must cultivate the service attitude. Unless the service attitude is revived, the conception of Virata realization will have very little effect on this year. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.1.26. All right, so this is from the first chapter which we're studying today, text 26. Prabhupada is explaining the importance of having that service attitude. Otherwise, simply contemplating the universal form has no benefit. We have to have the mood that, to give service, to recognize there's a supreme, there's someone above, there's a superior above us. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, I have a question in the previous slide. Yes. Uh, when, when it is said, just when it says that uh, unless and until, uh, if anyone wants to realize supreme truth by considering the universe from the Lord, he must cultivate a service attitude. Uh, but Maharaj, how will, as long as he is in the impersonalist view, how he can develop a service attitude? Because service attitude will come only if he's thinking Lord in the personal feature. <laughs> yes, right. But you see, he may, he may be contemplating the impersonal feature, but it's not that we want them to remain impersonalists. You see, 
we're simply contemplating the virata rup. It's not that, although it's an impersonal feature, we don't want them to be impersonalists. They have to come. They, the, I, this is why Prabhupada is pointing out here the importance of the service attitude. The, this visualization of the world. Prabhupada said, if it's in a spirit of lording over it as an impersonal, this is not God realization. We want them to become God realized. So the point of, which is being made is that we want people to become God realized by contemplating the universal form. Not that they should simply think that I'm God, I'm one with that, but they should understand. The, 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 so this, this is a very important point here. This the materialistic view of exploitation of the material resources is occasioned by the illusion of the external energy of the Lord. So that's the tendency. We want to exploit the resources of the material world. So that's the external energy of the Lord. But if anyone wants to realize the supreme truth by conceiving of the universal form of the Lord, he must cultivate the service attitude. So the service attitude is revived. Unless it's revived, the conception will have very little effect on the seer. So it's not that we just want people to become impersonalists. That will make their heart hard. But we do want them to understand that, there's a, that there is this concept of God from the universe. But the mood, Prabhupada's making the point, the mood has to be to give service, not simply, I'm God. Not that we cultivate the impersonal mood, I am God, I am that, I am part of the universe, I'm God. That's not what, we want the mood of, I'm the servant. This, you know, the relationship with the Virata Rupa is the, is the form of the Supreme, and I'm the servant of that Supreme. We simply cultivate the impersonal mood, then it will be very difficult. And it is very difficult to also cultivate that impersonal mood. That's described in the Bhagavad Gita, right? That Krishna says, Klesho dikataras te sham avyakta saktache. Very, they'll make advancement very slowly and with great difficulty, and there's so many things to be understood. But they just simply have to understand the Lord as a person from the universe by seeing the universe in relation to the Supreme that there's a Supreme and I am the servant. So when we hear about this pantheism from a devotee, then we will be safe from the fall into impersonal, into the impersonal conception. <coughs> we don't want people trapped into imper to go into imper become hard impersonalists. We're trying to save them from that. Can you understand my point, Maharaji? Yes, Maharaj. Understood, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, uh, we have to be clear about this, that we don't, we don't want to just make somebody an impersonalist because then it's very difficult to bring people up to devotees. <laughs> we, we want them, but we, we do want them to understand the all-pervading energy of, and how it's related to the Supreme, how this world is the energy of God, and He's a person. And this will purify them. But not that we are God, we are the servant. So this is very important point. 
So we're going to hear now how to conceive of the Virata Rup, and of course this is uh, colourful, <laughs> hearing of all the different parts, everything in the world that we see is all part of that universal form. From text 24, this gigantic manifestation of the phenomenal material world as a whole is the personal body of the Absolute Truth. <laughs> Here's the, the ISKCON diagram of this. You can see the material body, earth, water, fire, air, like this, with the soul. So everything in the world is perceived in relation to the Supreme. Persons who have realized it have studied that the planets known as Patala constitute the bottom of the feet of the Universal Lord. And the heel and the toes are the Rasatala planets. The ankles are the Mahatala planet. And his shanks constitute the Talatala planet. That's text 26. So these planets are all in the lower region of the universe, the subterranean planets, subterranean heavenly planets, or a, heli, a, a little above the hellish planets. Uh, Patala, Dhruva Maharaj, I think, resides there. The, the different planets and subterranean regions, they're like the lower parts of the body of the universal form. Then birds. Text number 36, Sukadeva Goswami speaks about birds. He says, the varieties of birds are indications of his masterful artistic sense. Again, we have to be careful and not to become caught in contemplating the beauty of nature. You know, there are people who, nature lovers, and they study the birds, and they, you know, they will, they will spend a lot of time and money, and they travel to many places, and they will do great austerities just to stay and wait to get a picture of a bird like this, you know. Of course, this is a swan, but there are different types of rare birds. And people become fascinated by these things and they become so absorbed in nature that they never think about who's behind this, who is the who's creator. So that's the important point to be remembered. Uh, one morning Prabhupada was on a morning walk. This was in Hyderabad actually. And uh, it was a nice morning and the sun was coming up and one of the young devotees who was there with Prabhupada, he said to Prabhupada, he said, Oh Prabhupada, look at the sun, isn't it a beautiful sunrise? And Prabhupada looked at him and said, If you still want to enjoy the material world, you will have to take birth again. So Prabhupada was pointing out, don't become overly absorbed in the beauty of the material world, but understand who is the artist who is behind this. So here it's mentioned, the variety of birds are all indications of his masterful artistic sense. And certainly there is a lot of beauty and it's very uh, artistic. Very well done. Here we see the ocean is his waist and the hills, and mountains are the stacks of his bones. So it's good to be able to remember these different features of the Virata Rup and to be able to describe the different aspects of the body of the universal form. So the hills, the mountains, the ocean is the waste, the hills and mountains are his bones. And then the rivers are the veins of the gigantic body. 
and the trees are the hairs on his body, and the omnipotent air is his breath. Certainly, these kind of scenes, oh, so beautiful, oh, I want to go there, and so <laughs> We should just simply contemplate, who is the person behind this, who has created all this? Who is the designer? Just like when we see a beautiful building, we should, who's the architect? The clouds which carry water are also the hairs, but they're the hairs on his head. The trees were the hairs on his body, clouds are the hairs on his head, and the terminations of days or nights are his dress, and the supreme cause of material creation is his intelligence. His mind is the moon and the reservoir of all changes. His mind is the moon. On a full moon night, full moon nights, you know, if, if you're ever in a, in a big city like New York, on a full moon night, there's always a crazy people running around. Somehow the moon influences the minds of people. And when the moon is full, then some people, they're very highly affected. They become very crazy. I remember sometimes how people would come to our temple on the full moon night and banging the doors. They were just crazy. So the, the, the moon is related to the mind. Mind is the moon. And then some questions. Is the universal form material, transcendental, or simply imaginary? So you have to read, first of all, I want you to read Prabhupada's purport to Bhagavad Gita 11.5 and 11.45. And let's try to reconcile them. So, have you got your Bhagavad Gita handy? Let me get mine. Okay. Eleven five. Yes. Who's got the Bhagavad Gita? Who can read for us? The purport? Ismaraj. Yeah, the purport to Bhagavad Gita 11.5. Arjuna wanted to see Krishna in his universal form, which although a transcendental form is just manifested for the cosmic manifestation and is therefore subject to the temporary time of this material nature. All right. All right. That's enough. I think that's all we need to read. What is said here then? What does it say about the universal form? So it, it is there only as long as this metal manifestation is there. It manifests and unmanifests. Come on, read the sentence again. Arjuna wanted to see Krishna in his universal form, which although a transcendental form All right. is just That's it. Although a transcendental form, right? So Prabhupada says here, it's a transcendental form, right? But it's just manifested for the cosmic manifestation and is therefore subject to the temporary time of the material nature. So, Prabhupada describes it there as transcendental, right? Yes. Now go to 11.45. Yes, go ahead, read the purport. 
Arjuna is always in confidence with Krishna because he is a very dear friend and as a dear friend is gladdened by his friend's opulence. Arjuna is very joyful to see that his friend Krishna is supreme personality of Godhead and can show such a wonderful universal form. But at the same time, after seeing that universal form, he is afraid that he has committed so many offenses to Krishna out of his unalloyed friendship. Thus, his mind is disturbed out of fear, although he had no reason to fear. Arjuna, therefore, is asking Krishna to show his Narayana form because he can assume any form. This universal form is material and temporary as the material world is temporary. Okay. But Okay, that's the, that's the important sentence. <clears throat> right, read it again. This universal form is material and temporary as the material world is temporary. All right, so 11.5 said the universal form was what? Transcendental. And 11.45 said universal form is? Material and temporary. So, can we reconcile them? How can we understand? Is this a contradiction? No, Maharaj. Hmm? Hare Krishna, no, it, Maharaj. It's yes. not contradictory. Not contradictory. Because, yeah, because a, a form of the Lord is transcendental, uh, but it is temporary because the material world is temporary. Yes. So that is why it gets finished. Okay. So it is not at all contradictory. Okay. Very good. Everybody agree? Because it is not like our material body, so it is transcendental. So in that sense, it is transcendental. Yes. But then it manifests only for this material world, so it is temporary. So in that sense, he is saying it is material. Okay. All right. Everybody agree? Yes, Maharaj. And yes, also, Maharaj. Uh, this transcendental form does not exist in the spiritual world like the forms of Krishna, other forms of Krishna, which exist eternally in the spiritual world. But no. although it is transcendental because it is the Lord's form, Still, it is manifested materially and temporarily. Where is that from? Uh, I remember from Bhakti Shastri Maharaj, uh, from Bhagavad Gita only. Okay, but, but uh, we're working on these quotes here. I just wanted to hear yes, from Maharaj. these quotes. Yes, Maharaj. Let's go ahead. Wait, there's another part here. Oh. All right, now compare these. Compare both those these purports with Srimad Bhagavatam 1 3 30. Uh, do you have the first canto there? 1 3 30? Someone have the first do you have a folio or some do you have the, the first canto? You can open to 1 yes, 3 30. Maharaj. Yes? Yes, Maharaj. Do you have it? You can read it? Uh, the portrait match? Yes. Yes. The conception of the Lord known as the Vishwarupa or the Virat Rupa is particularly not mentioned along with the various incarnations of the Lord because all the incarnations of the Lord mentioned above are transcendental and there is not a tinge of materialism in their bodies. There is no difference between the body and self as there is in the conditioned soul. The Virat Rupa is conceived for those who are just neophyte worshippers. For them, the material Virat Rupa is presented and it will be explained in the second canto. In the Virat Rupa, the material manifestations of different planets have been conceived as his legs, hands, etc. Actually, all such descriptions are for the neophytes. The neophytes cannot conceive of anything beyond matter. 
the material conception of the Lord is not counted in the list of his factual forms. As Paramatma or Super Soul, the Lord is within each and every material form, even within the atoms. But the outward material form is but an imagination, both for the Lord and for the living being. The present forms of the conditioned souls are also not factual. The conclusion is that the material conception of the body of the Lord as Virat is imaginary. Both the Lord and the living beings are living spirits and have original spiritual bodies. Okay. So, what did Prabhupada say there about the universal form? What was the it's conclusion? Imaginary. Yeah? It was imaginary. It's imaginary. Yes. Said imaginary. Read it again. Read that sentence again. Yes, uh, As Paramatma or Super Soul, the Lord is within each and every material form, even within the atoms. But the outward material form is but an imagination, both for the Lord and for the living being. The present forms of the conditioned, conditioned souls are also not factual. The conclusion is that the material conception of the body of the Lord as Virat is imaginary. Yes. Okay. So material conception of the body of the Lord is imaginary. Alright. Now go to 2nd Canto chapter 5 text 36. Yes, please. The word kalpayanti or imagine is significant. The Virat universal form of the absolute is an imagination of the speculative philosophers who are unable to adjust to the eternal two-handed form of Lord Sri Krishna. Although the universal form as imagined by the great philosophers is one of the features of the Lord, it is more or less imaginary. It is said that the seven upper planetary systems are situated above the waist of the universal form, whereas the lower planetary systems are situated below his waist. The idea impressed herein is that the Supreme Lord is conscious of every part of his body and nowhere in the creation is there anything beyond his control. Hare Krishna. So, was there no reference there to the Virata Rup? Uh, no, Maharaj. 2536, this was the purport. It is there, it is there uh, Maharaj. Second line. The Virat universal form of the Absolute is an imagination yeah. of the speculative philosophers. Okay. So who are unable to adjust. Uh -huh. yeah. Right. Thank you, Mataji. Yes. So, is the universal form material, transcendental, or imaginary? <laughs> what do you say? It is transcendental and imaginary. Is it not material? <clears throat> material in the sense it comes in this material. I mean, the people who are materialist, for them to conceive, he takes on. Yes. In, in what sense is not material? In sense, ours is material body, but his is not material. Yes. Matter can that be... That way it is transcendental. <clears throat> it can be material, but it can also be transcendental, just like we, we convert material. matter into spirit, right? Matter can, can become spirit when we use it, when we, the material body can also be transcendental by using it for Krishna's service. Maharaj, uh, another point that uh, comes to my mind is Srila Prabhupada, I think in one of the uh, purport or lecture I heard, is his energies are always transcendental. Uh, uh, though some are manifesting for some time, it can be un also understood with an analogy that uh, electricity can be used for uh, either creating of heat or creating of cold. So, means from Krishna's 
perspective, matter and spirit is like that. So these both are transcendental, but because it, it is manifested for some time and it is uh, uh, unmanifesting after that particular time, it can be called as uh, material and it is also imaginary because uh, there is no factual form, it is just a imagination of the speculative philosophers. Yes, okay. So the Lord's universal form is material, it's transcendental and it's also imaginary. So I hope you're okay with that. Don't be too much confused so, about it. So, so Mara, so this is basically Achintya Veda Veda Tattva. Well, that's one, one way to look at it. Yeah. Well, everything is a chincha beta beta tantva according to our philosophy. <laughs> yes. So, yes. We can say that with the universal forms also a chincha beta beta tantva. Oh, a final conclusion about the nature of the universal form. Okay, I think we've done that. We've made our conclusion that the Lord's form is. Achincha beta beta tatva. Mataji gave a conclusion. <laughs> okay, very good. Very well done. Very good participation from the students. All right, someone please read this one. What is the universal form? The Supreme Personality of Godhead by this partial representation measuring not more than nine inches as super soul expands by this potential energy in the shape of the universal form which includes everything manifested in different varieties of organic and inorganic materials Shrimad Bhagavatam 2.6.13 to 16 all right so is the universal form real or imaginary some quotes here the Virat universal form of the Absolute is an imagination of the speculative philosophers who are unable to adjust to this eternal two-handed form of Lord Sri Krishna. Although the universal form, as imagined by the great philosophers, is one of the features of the Lord, it is more or less imaginary. That's chapter 3, text 36, and then one more, which is third canto. The Virata Rupa is not, therefore, an eternal form of the Lord, exhibited in the spiritual world. It is a material manifestation of the Lord. The Arch of Igraha, or the worshipable deity in the temple, is a similar manifestation of the Lord, for the neophytes. But in spite of their material touch, such forms of the Lord as the Virat and the Archa are all non-different from his eternal form as Lord Krishna. So we've come to a nice conclusion there. Some more quote. This is from the 11th canto. It is nearly, it is merely the temporary imaginary resemblance of his personal form within the kingdom of Maya. In the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam as well as in the second canto, the universal form of the Lord is clearly explained to be an imaginary form offered to the neophyte for meditation on God. Similarly, the Virata Rup, or universal form of the Lord, is an imaginary form meant to help the gross materialists gradually understand the position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So second quote is from Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, Chapter 5, Text 2, and the first one was 11th Canto, Chapter 3, Text 12. So again, both all these quotes confirming the universal form is imaginary. Oh. Mm. 
the farm. Can someone read this one? The farm signifies Arjuna is a manifestation by Krishna's internal potency. Bhagavad Gita 11.47 purport. The form is contained within Krishna's two armed form. Some. Only the pure devotee can see that form. Bhagavad Gita 11.48. A devotee is not much interested in the universal form, for it does not enable one to reciprocate living feelings, loving feelings. Loving feelings. This is an important point to be brought out in the people who appreciate the universal form. They won't develop that loving feeling for the Lord. They, it will simply be awe, but there will be no real loving feeling. And there will be no difficult... You can see Arjuna seeing the universal form. How did he feel? You know, it, it didn't give him pleasure. So. It's, it's not Krishna's internal potency, it's external potency. At the same time, only the pure devotees can see that form. Well, that's Krishna's two-armed form. Yeah? Someone read? Those who are impersonalists, are also imagining that they are seeing the universal form of the Lord. But from Bhagavad Gita, we understand that the impersonalists are not devotees. Therefore, they are unable to see the universal form of the Lord. Bhagavad Gita 11.48 per quote. <laughs> they imagine they are seeing the universal form. But... <laughs> His Virata Rupa exists and is all-pervading. However, the Lord shows that form only to whom He chooses. So, some interesting points. Okay, now here, here's a, another interesting conversation, Prabhupada talking. The universal form is also considered personal though not human. So Malati Maharaji is talking to Prabhupada. She asked Prabhupada, what class of impersonalists are worshipping the universal form? And Prabhupada replies, well, universal form is not impersonal. That is personal. That is also a manifestation of Krishna. And Malati said, but, but you say that in one of your purports you are saying impersonalists are worshipping the universal form. Prabhupada said, they are advised. And Shamsundar adds, ah, advised to worship. <laughs> mm. Excuse me one minute. So what do you think about this conversation? <laughs> first of all, what do we learn? We learn, first of all, uh, that the impersonalists, 
They're advised to worship the universal form. Do they worship it? Usually not. What did we just we heard also? They they don't really see the universal form. Do they worship it? No. They think they they're part of. They just think of themselves as one with the universal form. They're advised to worship. If they worship it, that is developing the service mood. That is actually becoming devotee. <laughs> so it's an interesting conversation, right? Maharaj, yes. uh, is it they don't worship because they do not have the service attitude as we learned? Yes, before? exactly. That's right. They don't have the service attitude. They have to cultivate that service attitude. Mm. Very good. And you just, this, we see the same thing with the Buddhists. You know, the Buddhists, they're all, you know, they contemplate Buddha, but they don't serve the Buddha. They don't have the mood of service to the Buddha. They just think, be, I am the Buddha, become the Buddha. They all, they're all Buddhas. Mm. They don't have the service mood. So it's the service mood which is important. So, uh, so Maharaj, like last, in the previous one, two slides, we learned that uh, unless and until we develop the service attitude, those who are impersonalists, they cannot move ahead to the Bhagavan realization. So, from this it is evident, so that means we have to, I know, I'm, I'm just thinking, maybe you can correct me, Maharaj. That means whoever develops a service attitude, who have come to the platform of this um, um, Virata Rupa, if they worship, only such people are eligible and they go to the next step. The rest of them, they don't go at all. That is how we need to understand this, Maharaj. Yes, right. Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> you have to have the service attitude. Very important. Mm. So, so that's the reason we often times when we meet these people, uh, they just uh, they don't come out of their shell and they cannot accept the person feature of the Lord. Yes. So maybe that's the reason. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They okay. simply. You know, impersonalism, uh, it's all one, you know, we're all God, and yeah, there's no mood, there's no mood of giving service. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, we learned that uh, the jnanis who meditate, like those who uh, follow the Ashtanga Yoga process, their aim is to go to the personal feature, of, uh, uh, sorry, the Paramatma feature of the Lord. So, uh, their destination is also the spiritual world. But since th those people who do not have the service attitude cannot enter into the spiritual planets, then how can we say that they also are transcendentalists? Well, transcendentalist means that they've realized they're not the body. They're above the modes, right? They can be above the modes of nature. They should be above the modes of nature. Someone who's transcendental, they're free from the modes of passion and ignorance. And they've situated, they've, they're de they've detached themselves from the bodily demands and urges and things which are dictated by material senses. So they've transcended that level. They've come to understand themselves as Brahman. Right? So you were talking about someone's realized the Paramatma, they've realized the Super Soul. So are, are they thinking, I am the Super Soul? It says that we have the Advaitis, right? The Advaitis, they're thinking everything is one. So everything is Brahman. So I, I am, I am the Brahman. I'm. The, uh, they don't, they don't think, they don't talk about Paramatma. They only talk about the Atman, the Brahman, because there's only one for them. There's no question of Jivatma and Paramatma. For the Advaitis, there's only the Atman. So they don't make any distinction. So there's no mode of service. 
And so the goal of the, these people, what do they do? They simply do not negate everything, stop everything, don't do anything. This is the impersonalist. Impersonalism is negation of everything. So even Paramatma bodies, you know, they may realize the, the, the soul, but they have to understand there's two souls, not one. There has to be two souls, then the mood of service will be there. So does the Paramatma Vadi, has he realized that? You know, he's realized the Paramatma, but if, he, if he's thinking, I am the Paramatma, you know, we're all Paramatma, he, then there's no mood of service. Okay, thank you, Mahesh. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So I have, uh, means sometimes heard some of the Paramatma Vadi, and they also have this service attitude. They accept that they are Atma and there is a Paramatma and Paramatma is there in everybody's heart and who is the creator of this world. So they wanted to, they want to serve the Paramatma. So I have seen some of those Paramatma Vadi also. Oh yeah, that's, well that's Vaishnava actually, if they're thinking like that. That is Vaishnava. And we have that. Yes, the old, sorry Maharaj. We're not against that. We're in favor. We encourage that. That's good. Okay. They contemplate the Lord as Paramatma. Yeah. The only thing that they uh, does not believe is uh, Krishna is the supreme personality, and uh, they consider Krishna as uh, a superhuman or some kind of an incarnation like that. Yes. Yeah, sometimes we get that, of course. We get people, uh, yeah, of course, you've got other Vaishnavas, some other Sampradayas, you know. Uh, you know, and what is the, the Sri Vaishnavas, for example, you know, every, Narayan is the Supreme and Krishna is just an avatar from Narayan. And it's every Vishnu or Narayan is the Supreme Lord. Krishna is just one of the avatars. Mm, and, and there's no Chaitanya. They don't follow, of course, Lord Chaitanya, they don't accept him as an avatar. So they have their philosophy, but the mood is still, the, the mood is, they're the servant. The mood of being the servant of this, the, the, there's a Supreme Lord and the living entity is the servant. So that's very good. Just the fact that they, they recognize there is a Supreme Lord and the relationship between the Lord and the living entity is the master and servant. So that's very nice, that's very good. There be dif there's differences on the philosophy, yeah, different, you know, who is the supreme and the level of the, you know, the nature of the spiritual world and so on. These things are, you know, there's different philosophies there. But generally the mood is there in all the Vaishnava Sampradayas that there's a Supreme Lord and the living entity is a servant. And so we, we're happy with that. And that's why you see Prabhupada quotes sometimes. Ramanuja Acharya, he will quote him in different purports. So many quotes are there from Ramanuja Acharya. And so when we don't, we don't argue with these people, you know, we're good, we're happy, we have nice relationships with them. They also, you know, they also respect Krishna consciousness. So Paramatma Vadi, yeah, it's, it's, it's there, it, you know, it's, it's Good, that they, they've realized the Lord there and they, and they have the mood to give service to him. Okay, not a problem. The Stanga yogis, of course, they usually, that's what happens with them. They're paramount and they're meditating on the super soul. Okay, we'll go ahead. How a devotee sees the creation. For our personal contemplation, 
The advanced devotee certainly sees everything, mobile and immobile, immobile, but he does not exactly see their forms. Rather, everywhere he immediately sees manifest the form of the Supreme Lord. So this verse is often quoted by Prabhupada, describing the vision of uh, you know, a very advanced devotee, that he sees everywhere the form of the Supreme Lord. Of quite a difference from the neophyte devotee contemplating the Virata Rup. This is how the devotee, the advanced devotee, will see. He won't, he won't see their forms, but he will see everywhere the form of the Lord. Okay? So, let's see what we covered. By the end of the lesson, the student should be able to explain the progression of Sukadev's instructions. Why is he describing Bhakti Mishra Yoga? with meditation on the Virata as its beginning stage? And why is Parikshit interested in hearing it? Right? So, why is Sukadeva, why is Sukadeva describing Bhakti Mishra Yoga with meditation on the Virata at its beginning stage? Somebody can refresh our memory on this? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Pranams. Uh, one is to, uh, uh, it is a first step of realization, so, we, so he is giving an uh, opportunity for the neophyte also to come into the path of bhakti. That is first reason we saw. And then the second reason is there are a lot of, uh, the, the, the assembly was filled with people of all kinds. And Srimad Bhagavatam is meant for everybody. So from that aspect, from the first step of realization, gradually he is explaining it as Lord Krishna explained in Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. So these are the two reasons we saw. And why is Parikshit interested in hearing it? Because as a king, he is concerned about everyone. He is concerned about all the citizens and there are various types of citizens. So he wants to benefit everybody, Lokahitam we saw. So uh, in the mood of compassion, he is ready to listen to it. Very good, yes. Anybody else like to add anything? Some of the men like to add anything more to this? Sukadev's progression? Men have gone quiet. Okay. Okay, let's hear from the men. Describe the main feature of the universal form. Describe some of the main features. Can you remember something? Let's hear some things. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the universal form is uh, imaginary. Uh, it's temporary. Uh, it's uh, also material, but uh, because uh, it is, from, it is emanating from the uh, Lord, so it is spiritual. Yes. Okay. Tell me some of the features, though. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, yes. the universal form is uh, imagined by the speculative philosophers, and it is, uh, they imagine that the Lord's feet uh, are the lower planetary systems and uh, gradually the upper planetary systems are his thighs and waist and slowly the, the earthly planet is uh, near the waist of the Lord uh, and the upper planetary system, the other seven planets, planetary systems are his upper part of the body and uh, his head is considered as the Satya Loka or Brahma Loka. So this is the kind of imagination okay. and uh, yeah, that's it. Yes. Uh, Krishna Maharaj, it's, uh, it is the vibhutis of the Lord. Like the, all the opulences. Can you tell uh, me some of these opulences? 
which are there and where, which part of the body do they represent? Uh, it is mentioned actually in uh, Shimad, uh, that is Bhagavad Gita, 7th chapter, Bhumi, uh, Bhumi Racho Naya, uh, Nalavayu. And then again, uh, in the 10th chapter, it, it uh, mentions about the material opulences like stars, moons, everything in relation to Krishna. And in 11th chapter also, Arjuna asks uh, to show the form, uh, the, the show, show the forms of the Vibhutis which he shows. And then again in the 12th chapter, he talks about uh, what are the qualities? Uh, uh, what are the qualities that uh, the devotees has to develop? Uh, and to understand these subjects, he preemptively talks about the material bhutis of the body. Yes. Okay, but I I want to know specifically which, which features. Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, we saw that uh, the ocean is his waist, the hills and mountains are the slats of his bones, the rivers are the uh, veins, and then uh, the hair of the body is. Uh, the tree, and then uh, we saw the mountain. Uh, uh, no, uh, the air. Uh, hair. Air, air. Air, air is his breath. Oh. Air is his breath. breath. Yeah. Air is breath. Then clouds. Uh, we saw the descriptions of clouds uh, as uh, um, head, and then uh, we saw. The clouds are what? It's a hairs. Hairs on the head. Hairs on the head. Hair, hair on the head. Hair yeah. on the Sorry. head. Okay. Hair on the head. Yes. Okay. What about the moon? Um, this is intelligence. Huh? Uh, moon is his mind. Mind, mind, mind. 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 And we discussed about the full moon night also. You have quoted some uh, happenings in the temple. And what yes, about friends. the sun? Sun is his eyes. Eyes. Sun is the eye of the Lord. Yes, right, right. And okay. the termination of day and night are his dress. Okay, and what about the Brahmanas? Where are they in the in the universal form? His legs. And the Kshatriyas, where are the Kshatriyas? His arms. And the Vaishya? His waist. The Vaishya, what? The belly, right? Belly. 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 The Sudra? Legs. 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 Feet. Legs. Feet. Okay, the legs. Legs, okay. And then the... And the, uh, the so everybody's there within the universal form. All different, everything that we see in this world, it's all there within this universe. Okay, and then explain the importance of developing service attitude and respect for God's creation, as opposed to the exploiting mentality typical of conditioned souls. Oh, so this, this is a very important part of this class which we've done today. That, that we want to definitely cultivate this. People contemplating the, the universal form. All right, you can contemplate the universe. We're not ready to understand the Lord in the temple, the spiritual form of the Lord. We can simply see the Lord in the form of the universe this pantheistic approach. But there must be the mood to, be, to become the servant, not to think of ourselves as one with the creation, become absorbed in the one. And don't get enamored by the energy, rather focus on the energetic, the source of that energy. If we appreciate the energy, we appreciate nature, we should think how much wonderful the Creator must be. And we should be eager to contemplate that. Then the benefit of meditating on the universal form for those unable to appreciate Krishna's personal form. What's the benefit? What benefits will there be there in meditating on the universal form? Yes. Uh, the benefit is that the person will at least uh, accept the sub subordination to the higher power and thus gradually come to appreciate the creator and then the personal form. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, uh, But by this one, they will come to know that there is a person behind this world and we should serve 
him. Yeah, but, uh, that is a benefit. It is like a favor to them. Mm -hmm. And another benefit, Maharaj, it is a uh, it is a recognized yoga system, and uh, by performing this yoga system, they will gradually purify, and then come to the understanding that uh, means in the Brahman realization platform, they will gradually be elevated to. Yes. Uh, I, I think one important point is that, uh, it, you know, Krishna's personal form, someone may not be so much able to, you know, they're not able to appreciate that. They, they simply think, well, what, how is this God? You know, it's just a statue, you know, it's just a, they, they can't see the transcendental nature of the deity. But when they contemplate the universal form, it's something very, uh, very it's very uh, something very real that they can actually see in front of them. They can visualize the the whole thing, and it's uh, a, a, a more realistic approach to contemplating the the idea of the supreme. It's, not everyone's mind can, they're not so open-minded to be able to understand the nature of Krishna's internal potency. But they can see the external potency in the creation. It's there in front of them. There it is. There's the rivers, there's the mountains, there's the sun and the moon and the planets and all around you. You can see everything. You can understand there's a some universe, there's some form there within this world. So it's something very uh, fine, very, uh, sub, very what, what could we say, it's, 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 it's actually manifest there in front of them. It's something they can grasp with their limited mind and intelligence. And that is difficult for them without having to, to understand the deity form, it's more difficult for people, unless they're brought up in that kind of culture or familiar with it. But it's easier for people to accept the, the form of the universe, to see everything in relation to some great personality. And then, finally, describe the nature of the universal form as a temporary but transcendentally surcharged personal manifestation of Krishna. So I think that's a nice way to describe what I was trying to say, that it's a personal manifestation, it's an actual manifestation, and we can see it in front, which is not so easy to see in the deity form or in Krishna, when we talk about Krishna's personal form, if you talk about the super soul, for example, you know, contemplate the super soul, it's not manifested. But he, the universe is a manifestation. It's temporary manifestation, but at the same time it's transcendental. And we could say it's imaginary also, but it's there. If we, if we, if we think about it, we can visualize it. So that is the nature of the universal form. It's described for us. Personal manifestation. Okay, so that's uh, the end of the lesson. Are there any questions? Thank you, Maharaj. Yes? Sorry, sorry, Master, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Maharaj, it's not a question. One more point, what I learned in today's classes, uh, I didn't know the important benefit of uh, Virat Rupa. One of the benefits is, uh, Prabhupada said that it will cl gradually cleanse the dirty things from the hearts of the neophyte uh, so that they become qualified to see the form. This was something new that I learned today. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, contemplating the universal form cleanses the heart of the neophyte. Of course, we have a much better approach to cleansing the heart simply by chanting the holy name. It's much more powerful yes. and effective and much more rapid than contemplating yes. the universe. 
But for yes, yes. But for the neophytes, okay, let them do that. Contemplate the universal form. Okay, thank you. Maharaj, one important aspect which take away for me was I not until now know the difference between why um, from the Brahman some people can go to the stage up to Bhagavan but some people cannot go. So the service attitude is what is important that which is the triggering or the impetus to go to the next level. So this was a wonderful point which you brought out today Maharaj taking from the different that was something very wonderful. Because I used to always think, we, they say that we can go from each stage, but why some people don't go? So today, it, I got clear clarity that because the service attitude is not there, they cannot go to the next level. So that was something very wonderful, Maharaj. Thanks a lot for that. Yeah, very important. You know, when we go, when we go to temple, we always try to get people engaged in some service. You know, if they start doing some service, that's a very healthy sign. And it helps them to advance very quickly. If we see someone has the mood to give service, to do service, so helpful. So, and then they progress very quickly. So, thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Any any other points? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Just one question was that uh, maybe five thousand years back, when this discussion was going on, there was uh, such worshippers. But in today's contemporary world, uh, we know that there are some very few sections maybe who are doing this kind of a worship. But do you see that there are uh, like large section of the people who does this kind of Virat Rupa worship uh, practically? Well, yeah, we do see uh, there are people who are inclined towards that, certainly, you know. Not every, as it be said, not everybody is able to contemplate the, the the divinity form, the form of. I see. A, I know one Buddhist group, for example, in Thailand. They have that contemplation of everything. Of course, the Buddhists they don't believe in God as such, but they simply worship the universe. So they see everything as you know, just being the universe. They, can't, they, don't under, they don't accept the, the existence of a creator, but they do like to contemplate the universe. So Thank you, Maharaj. That is and the, I also, yeah. that is, it, it is there. The, the, there are the good... No, impersonalism is, tends to be more, more common than personal philosophy. You know, devotees are not so many. The impersonalists are much more. A lot of people have the impersonal philosophy. They just don't practice it. Although they, they, they may, they have that mood of being impersonalist. They don't, they don't do anything. They're just, they're just, well, of course, most of the people, vast majority of people are simply materialistic. They're simply material. But you do get people who are impersonalists. They're endeavouring for the transcendental. They don't like, sometimes they're against organised religion and so on, and they, they're more inclined to solitude and going away from the world, and they contemplate the world like that. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You discussed so much about uh, service attitude. So my question is, uh, in the impersonalist, uh, suppose I meet an impersonalist, how I ignite the fire of a service attitude uh, towards him? Can you give some more tips, Maharaj? Well, that's the ingenuity of a devotee. That somehow or other you're able to engage someone and to, do, to get them to contribute some service. I remember His Holiness Jaipataka Swami Maharaj telling about how he was a young man and he wanted to go to India and he heard how there were devotees putting on a Rathiatra festival and he came by to see what was going on and the devotee asked him, do you know how to use a hammer? <laughs> and so he ended up giving, they gave him a hammer and some nails and he was hammering the Rathiatra cart together. So that's, you know, that's one example, you know, we, we're always, uh, our movement has got 
that kind of reputation that we're always trying to engage people, we always try to get people to do some service for Krishna. And get people, you know, give for Krishna. You got some flowers? Can you give some flowers for, can we get some flowers from your garden for Krishna? And the devotees would go and look for flowers, find somebody with a nice garden and ask them, could we get some of the flowers for our temple and like that. <laughs> and we, and we ask people, can you donate some of your vegetables for Krishna? So devotees are very, some devotees are very, very expert in that. They're very good in getting people to give service. You have to, we have to have that desire. We have to be thinking about it, how to engage people. This is Krishna consciousness, just like devotees this month they're going for the marathon for book distribution and they're thinking how to distribute books. You know, they want to engage people. They're trying to engage people. Finding people, first of all, who will take a book and who will read the book and get them to come to the temple, get them to give some money, to give donations, like that. So it's all service. Ours is a service movement, right? This, Krishna Consciousness is a service industry and our mood is to get people to give service. And of course we do service ourselves, we, we want other people to also give service. M most of the world nowadays is all service industries, you know, you go to a place like Singapore, Hong Kong, it's all service industries. So this is the real service, service to Krishna. Give service to Krishna. Yes? Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, anything else? Okay, so then we'll finish here and I'll meet you all next week. Okay. Vancha. Thank you very much. Vancha Kalpa, Terubhyascha, Kripa Sindhu, Bhaibacha, Patita Nam, Pavani Vyo, Vaishnavi Vyo, Namo Namo. Srila Prabhupada ki, Gorbakta Vrinda ki, Jai.